sing with us. We're glad you're here, church. And uh, nearby or far away, we're just glad that you chose it today to be here together with us. It is a bit chilly outside, but it's nice and warm in here. Thank you, Tim, for those songs, for the prayers, for the chance we had to meet around the Lord's Supper this morning and remember what he did for us. <coughs> As I was thinking about this lesson, I was remembering how when I was a child, there, we used to do lots of Christmas caroling. I lived uh, back when the crust of the earth was cooling and we were lived in a rural community. <laughs> and so the farmers would hitch up a trailer or two, sort of like, you know, Jan, Jan does for us every year. And we would just go out and climb on the trailers and we'd go somewhere and sing. I was in Texas about 2007. New Year's Day, and my sons, and he said, Dad, we're going to go over to a town nearby, and we're going to sing Christmas carols. Do you want to go? I said, sure. So we went over to this nearby town, and again, they had a cotton trailer 30 feet long. I didn't know they made trailers. I didn't know they made cotton that long. George, I never had any idea. But anyway, we climbed on this cotton trailer and bundled all out, but we were going through the town and singing, and we stopped, and people would come out of their homes, and we would stop at the homes of people who couldn't get out, and, and they'd have tears in their eyes as we tried to bring them a little joy. This morning, I want to talk about one of the songs, in fact, the one we just sang. It's listed, if you look at the book, it's listed as one of the Christmas carols. But if you look at the text that, that Fred just read for us, you find that it's really a song about praise. I mean, if, if you hadn't been prejudiced to know that that was a, supposed to be a Christmas carol, you would sing it. Of course, we do. We sing it here year around in the summer, in July, in August. We sing it all the time. But it is a song about praise. Isaac Watts wrote that song almost 300 years ago. And I, I, I'm told as I read about it that Psalm 98 is, well, that was the basis for which he took the words of the song. This last week I was having a bite to eat and there were a couple of ladies behind me. I'm not picking on the ladies, it's a true story. And they were talking a little loud like I would do. And they were chatting about how stressful it is this time of year. They were talking about, well, we got parties to plan, we got gifts to buy. You know, there's this huge meal that we got to get all prepared to cook, and then we got to take trips somewhere, or we got to house somebody. And as they talked about it, it wasn't the words they said, but it was the tone of the voice that left me saying, well, probably there's not a lot of joy in their life as they're headed into the season. <coughs> a lady was doing some last minute frantic Christmas shopping. You know what the frantic Christmas shopping is like? She was doing her best to collect stuff. She had been, been fighting the crowds. She was tired of going up and down the aisles of stuff, digging through people, trying to find a gift, only to find out that the last one had been sold a week ago. She finally works her way over to an elevator. She's got all of these bulky packages, and when, it, when they open the elevator, you can imagine what the people do. I mean, she's got, she's just this bulky package herself. So she opens the door and they get in, and, and so they close the door. The lady says, whoever's responsible for this Christmas thing should be arrested, strung up, and shot. <laughs> well, he made any sound, except finally there was a little single voice in the back of the elevator said, don't worry, they already crucified him. <laughs> we don't know. We absolutely don't know when Jesus was born. You know, if you do a little bit of reading in the Bible, you probably get the idea it's not December. It really doesn't matter to me when Jesus was born because there's two things that I'm excited to remember this morning about Jesus. Number one, God sent his son to be born as a baby. Now, I've thought about this many times. If I was going to bring a Savior into the world, and you don't want to know my plan because it stinks, but I wouldn't have done this. He sent his son to be born as a baby. The Philippian letter we read a few weeks ago said he emptied himself, and he became a man. He becomes flesh. He is born as, a, as helpless as any baby is born in our world. 
and it tells me of the meticulous detail that God goes to as he wants us to understand that he identifies uh, uh, we can identify with him through Christ or he can identify with Christ with us through Christ the second thing is that the birth of Christ is still, still being celebrated a lot of pushback in our world today some of us people who don't have any values or any morals and they don't care but I'm excited that after 2,000 years of Satan doing his very best to try to eradicate any memory of Jesus, we are still celebrating the birth of God's Son. Amen. Amen. There are people who, every day in our world, we don't know them, we don't know where they live, we don't even speak their language, but we will one day, when we gather around the throne together, we'll find people who learned about the birth of Jesus. And they came to believe in this miraculous conception of which God is the Father and Mary was the mother. They came to marvel at the life of Jesus, the sinless life of Jesus, especially when they look at their life or the life of someone around them. And then they're going to learn about the death and the burial. They're going to be thrilled at the idea of a resurrection. And there are people who become part of the body of Christ every day. But listen to me, none of that would happen without the birth of this baby, this son of God. I don't think it would matter when you celebrate uh, the birthday Jesus was born. It wouldn't matter whether you celebrate it in June or September or March, whenever you chose to celebrate it. There are people who would just celebrate the holiday. They'll ignore the Christ. Christ is not on their list. Christ is not part of their way of thinking. They're happy to do the holiday business, but don't get me involved in this Jesus business. Our world is desperate for joy. They asked the entertainer, Madonna, are you a happy person? And she replied, I am a tormented person. I'm wrestling with a lot of demons. I want to be happy. Do you want to understand? I have moments of happiness. I'm, I'm working towards knowing myself deep inside, and I assume that something will bring me happiness. Everybody in our world is looking for happiness. It's usually the way it's phrased. In fact, until I studied this lesson, I really hadn't thought about happiness versus joy. But we are looking for someone or something to make us happy. We work hard to buy things. This isn't a knock on working hard or buying things. We do that. We look for happiness in some other ways, entertainment, hobbies, sports, and a host of addictions. We are, we're involved in the addictions either because we think it will make us happy or to escape something. And we think, well, I could just if I could escape it, I can be happy. Or like Madonna, we look deep down inside, looking as though if we look inside deep enough, we could find that elusive thing called happiness. You know, if happiness is the primary goal, if you and I were to read in Scripture that that is the primary goal, we would be surprised to find that the Bible really has very little to say about happiness. Happiness is only used about 30 times. It's a little Greek word. But sometimes it's not even translated happy. They'll translate it something else. But I was surprised as I went through less than 30 times the whole Bible. Joy, on the other hand, is referred to about 300 times. And I kept thinking, well, what's the difference? And so I go looking at the word. Joy is used in the scripture and it talks about a much deeper, the only way I know to describe it, a deeper level of happiness. The basic difference between the two is happiness has to do with what's happening right now. It is 
the current idea. Happiness depends on circumstances. I give you an illustration. I had some things planned for Tuesday night this week. But the trash man couldn't find my trash. And so in the search of it, he drives all the way down my driveway and doesn't spot it until he turns around and drives back out by the road three feet from where he gets in. It's okay, it's his first day. But I get on the snowblower, just happy as a lark blow on the snow until I hit a piece of wood that he's knocked down from the tree. And it doesn't just go off the belt, it bends the impeller. The circumstances of the moment did not make me happy. <laughs> In fact, I had to cry help, help to a lot of brothers to figure out what to do. Now I know, by the way, if your snowboard gets along, call me. <laughs> but happiness depends on circumstances. Joy, on the, on the other hand, does not depend on what's happening now. Joy is an inner sense of well-being that rises above circumstances. And it does so because I have a sense of well-being because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Happiness may be temporal, may be temporary. But joy is something that is rooted in Christ. I didn't get that out of these two words until just this last week. In the first stanza of the song, there is joy when the king is received into the heart. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let her receive her king. Let every heart prepare in room. Heaven and nature sing. Historically, we know that not everyone was happy at the birth of Jesus. All you have to do is read in the beginning and you find that when the three magi came from the east and began to tell Herod, hey, there's a new baby in town. He's going to be king. That made him happy. That Herod kills three of his own sons. So he's not interested in the idea of sharing anything with a new king, even though he'd be dead by the time he was able to be king. Uh, I would someone today reject Jesus as king. I think it's the same reason that some rejected Jesus as king the time when he was on the earth. Got some suggestions for you. Number one, Jesus gets in the way of personal plans. Come on. If you want to do something, when you want to do it, and how you want to do it, you want to hang everything else, Jesus is going to get in the way of that. Or he's a threat to an individual kind of freedom. You know, as, as a nation, we, we pride ourselves in being free. We, we're grateful for the freedom we have that our forefathers gave us. But I wonder if our forefathers would have died for the kind of freedom the way we use it today. Jesus is the antithesis of everything for which people stand who don't want anything to do with him because he, Jesus, serves as a reminder of them that their life is headed in the wrong direction. Think about Herod versus these wise men. When Herod gets the news, he views him as a threat. When the Magi, the wise men from the west, they come, at east come, and they, they view him as a gift. They go to this baby, this, this little baby, and they pay him homage. The scripture says they came to worship him. I don't know all about it. I don't know how much they recognized. But the difference I suggest to you has to do with attitude. In the second stanza, we learn there's joy when the Savior reigns over Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods and rocks and hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. Of course they would. 
Ron, that's all they're going to do. That's all people should do. And it's as if the, the people aren't doing it enough, so the rocks and everything is going to cry out and praise to God. Jesus speaks of that on occasion. If I were silent, the rocks would cry out. Luke's right. Luke writes about the coming of Jesus. He says, Today, at the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Savior. Christ. There are people today who would like to have some kind of relationship with Jesus. There were people in Jesus' day who wanted a relationship with Him. At least it started that way. One day Jesus looks around and he asks his disciples, where's the, where's the crowds? I mean, there was 4,000 one day, there was 5,000 another, but where, where, what happened to them? Where were they all gone? People today would like some kind of relationship with Jesus. They would like to have him as a savior. When you talk about going to heaven, or if you go to someone in the hospital that dies, it's always, well, he's gone to heaven. Everyone wants him as a savior, but not everyone wants him as Lord. And if he can't be Lord of your life, he won't be the savior of your soul. Born today, a savior who is Christ the Lord. In the third stanza, we learn there's joy when the sinner stops letting sin reign in his or her life. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow Far as the curse is found. This phrase, for as the curse is found, in the baby whose birth we celebrate, you choose when you want to celebrate. But you need to celebrate the birth of God's Son. We gaze on the face of our champion in a struggle that could not be won without Him. He is our champion. If you and I, in time, could transport ourselves back to the manger, and there we are with, with Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and we watch Mary as any mother holds her newborn son in adoration and, and excitement and joy. But you see, you and I know that in just a few short years, he will literally be beaten within an inch of his life. And God is going to allow humanity to do some ugly things to His Son for us. Between His birth, between His glory, there's the cross. But I want to be joyful about all of His life. I want to be joyful about the birth of God's Son. The Father of heaven and earth, listen close to this, did not hesitate to allow His only Son to become the Son of Mary in order to make His blessings flow as far as the curse is found. And that's everywhere. There is no place that sin does not affect man. And God so loved the world that He said, I'm going to give My Son, and He and the Godhead agreed to this. They planned it before the time began. And today still, there's no noise. There's no trumpet call. Still today, God's blessings flow as far as the curse is found throughout the world. You know, Satan prom promised Adam and Eve that eating, you know, it's going to make you, it's going to make you sharp. You're going to finally reach the epitome, but you've got to eat this thing. But after they ate, they found it really wasn't 
what they should have done. They ran into something called sin. <coughs> the scriptures tell us that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. <coughs> Sometimes we need to do that. Sometimes we may need to do it to each other. We may do, need to do it as part of our family. We may need to do it <coughs> before God. Don't let the word repent put you off. The little Greek word for repent, repent simply means to change your mind. To have a different way of thinking. It's like me looking at my life and examining it and then looking at what God wants for my life and examining it and going, wow, yeah, I don't want this anymore. I, I want that. I need to repent of this stuff. I, I want to deal with the Son of God. Bret Hart wrote a story about the Wild West. He called it the luck of roaring camp. <coughs> it's written about a mining town in California. Bunch of miners, whole bunch of men in town and only one Cherokee Indian. He tells the story, as he tells it, that she makes a living the only way she can and she winds up pregnant. And as she delivers the child, she dies. Here's the child in the midst of a mining camp. You can imagine the kind of people that are there. And so, in his story, they take the little girl and they wrap her in some old rags. Not dirty rags, but they're, they're old rags. And they put her in a box. And someone notices that it doesn't really seem right. So, one guy writes 80 miles and he buys a rosewood cradle. He comes back and they, they take the old rags and they put her in the, in the rosewood cradle. And another guy notices that something's not right. So he rides and he purchases some, some silky lacy blankets. And he comes back and now they wrap the little girl in all these these nice little blankets and, and, and the really frilly looking things and they put her in the rosewood cradle. And someone notices that the floor is terribly dirty. And so they, they clean the floor. Then someone else looks around and they notice the walls. They're tattered. They need to be papered. The ceiling, it needs some kind of some kind of paint put on it, and, and the windows are dirty. In a few days, they notice that they're going to have to give up some things because babies need not to sleep. All the brawling and busting beer bottles over each other's head, and the things that they do with a loud noise, that's got to stop because babies need sleep. You take the cradle. Because they're miners and they elect one each day to watch this baby. And they place this baby in a nice little area in the mine and the others work and the one takes care of the baby. Then one day they notice how ugly it is at the entrance of the mine and they said, we're going to plant some flowers here at the, at the entrance of the mine and it'll look a lot better. <coughs> well, it's only a story. But in the story, the baby changed everything in the lives of these people. I'm wondering, has the baby of Bethlehem changed your life? The last stanza teaches us there's joy when we come to know that God rules the world through truth and grace. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. The last verse, I think, explains the kind of joy that Jesus would like for us to experience. Those of us in Christ experience that joy, but he would like those in the world, for as the curse is found, 
His blessings still flow. And he'd like for them to experience it, but they're blind people. Blind people can't go very far very fast. They're always groping around looking for something. That's the condition of the world because the God of this age has blinded the mind of unbelievers. So they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is who is the image of God for we do not preach ourselves but Jesus Christ as Lord if you have a relationship with God today if you understand and you're not blind you are of all people blessed Satan doesn't want anyone seeing Christ as Lord. Because that means he loses the lordship of the lives. But this is the dad who found the challenge and went through. Dad found the challenge by Christmas. It was a habit of this family to put a little manger job on the front lawn and they, they, they did this and they, they got both Joseph and Mary and the baby and the animals. But the challenge to all of this was, was the son's favorite chore was the Trinosaurus Rex. Not one of these little hand jobs. You know, you could take a little hand job and you could put him in there among the animals and it wouldn't be a big deal. But this Triceratops Rex is when you, you blow it up. You know, it's about eight feet and you got this huge hulking thing. And the dad, it's out of place, but what's he going to do? So he just lets it go and he blows the thing up. But they put this thing behind the manger seat. <laughs> As I read the story, I thought about actually the menacing beast hovering over the manger may not have been as much out of place as you think. Because here you have this huge hole as it is looking over. First thing I thought of, that would be Satan. who would be trying to destroy anything that's good. The days of the, of the Garden of Eden, Eve, Eve was tempted by Satan, Adam was tempted by Eve. Satan was trying to prevent the birth of the Son of God. There was a struggle in all kinds of children throughout all of history. We're aware of two, but there's more. There's one at the time of Moses and one at the time of Jesus. Satan thinks if I can just get rid of this child, Satan doesn't get it. He's trying to get rid of the Son of God. You don't get rid of the Son of God. The Son of God has a purpose and a plan. He is going to be born as a baby. And that's going to be really, really important. What kind of baby is he? He's a baby that's destined for the cross. He grows up understanding. As a teenager one time, he said to his mom and dad, when they couldn't find him for two or three days, you remember the story, he said, I gotta be about my father's business. I gotta be in my father's house. He knows the plan of God. We just saying, this is the power of the cross. Son of God. Slain for us. What a love. What a cost. We stand forgiven. The cross. That's the victory, brothers and sisters, and that's the real joy of the baby Jesus. So we can sing, Joy to the world. The Lord is coming. Let earth receive your king. This is the kind of joy that you have today. Not to get. That love and that blessing is still flowing. As long as the curse is there, the grace of God will continue to flow. Because of the name of Jesus. You need to believe. Jesus, if you understand, repent, confess, we baptize you into Christ today, you need to hear a Christian experiencing, beginning a walk of real joy. 
Not some temporary happiness. That's going to come and go. But it's joy that you can put your full weight down on and live all of this life for. We look forward to eternity. If we could serve you in any way this morning, please let us know.